Are they gonna shoot missiles or something? <laughs> Betty Reed, Soskin, a ranger at the Rosie, the Riveter World War II Home National Historical Park in Richmond, California, has been on the job for 15 years, but that's not what she was celebrating. For on September 22nd, Soskin, whose tours are some of the most popular at the park, according to the people.com, turned 100 years old that day. Yeah, I've always been a bit of an outdoorsman. Uh, when I was a kid, my parents used to make me hang out in the backyard a lot and just run around until I got tired. She's the oldest active ranger in the National Park Service in 2015. She said she's not a trained historian. My tours are necessarily a way to share my oral history with the public. Tell the story of the African-American workers. She's so old that when she watches the History Channel, she said, hey, look, it's new. That's how old she is. All right. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing. And if you have trouble distributing your music, why don't you check out DistroKid in the link below. Who's your daddy? File this under marketing ideas gone wrong. Speech Academy Asia in Singapore painted clowns outside multiple primary schools in early September in an effort to persuade students to enroll in public speaking courses. The Straits Times reported in response, principals and parents urged students to stay away from strangers, including the clowns. Are you still scared of clowns? Yeah. Kelvin Tan, the director of the Academy, apologized for alarming people. He explained that the roadshow employees were told to put on cute mascot costumes, but he wasn't aware they'd be wearing clown getups. Maybe the clowns were too scary. It's wrong, and we won't do again, he said. I think the only people who think clowns are funny are clown people. Please stop it. I don't know what else to tell you. Unless you want to be a sexy clown like Harley Quinn or something. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing right here on the Coconut Daddy. Who's your daddy? File this under marketing ideas gone wrong. Speech Academy Asia in Singapore painted clowns outside multiple primary schools in early September in an effort to persuade students to enroll in public speaking courses. The Straits Times reported in response, principals and parents urged students to stay away from strangers, including the clowns. Are you still scared of clowns? Yeah. Kelvin Tan, the director of the Academy, apologized for alarming people. He explained that the roadshow employees were told to put on cute mascot costumes, but he wasn't aware they'd be wearing clown getups. Maybe the clowns were too scary. It's wrong, and we won't do again, he said. I think the only people who think clowns are funny or clown people please stop it i don't know what else to tell you unless you want to be a sexy clown like harley quinn or something thank you for subscribing liking and sharing right here on the coconut daddy who's your daddy remember the bernie sanders meme the look at the 2021 inauguration well a cozy parka a heavy knitted gloves you too can pull off the bernie look for halloween the Boston Globe reported for just $85, party goers can don the once again asking costume set from Dolls Kills. Includes the coat, the mittens, and surgical mask. Ah! Senator Sanders' office even commented, If fans of Senator Sanders' mittens are looking for a real scare this Halloween, they should see how the wealthy, the world's biggest corporations are fighting stuff Congress from finally addressing the long neglected needs of the working class said spokesperson Matt Kaska yeah. you also can get gloves too and I'll put you down a link below for a way to get some gloves for this Halloween and you guys have a wonderful day thank you for subscribing liking and sharing We're doomed. who's your daddy Timothy Wolf of Lake City arrived at the Lake City Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealership on September 22nd to buy a new car of course, WTLV TV reported that he had a trade in when employees checked the VIN number of the trade in. They found it was a car that had been stolen from that dealership just a few days earlier. Police were called. How stupid are you? And Wolf admitted to the theft, which had been captured on a surveillance camera. He was charged with grand theft and dealing in stolen property, among other crimes. 
Let me try to get you to imagine this. Timothy Wolf went to Lake City Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealership and he had a trade in. And he would have used that trade-in to buy a new car, but the trade-in was stolen from the exact same lot. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing. Who's your daddy? An elderly woman in Okemos, Michigan, moved to a nursing home, and an auction company was hired to clear out her home. Of course, it was reported on September 22nd, one of the items found by Epic Options and estate sales of Brad Stoker was a five-foot-tall granite headstone with the name Peter J. Weller on the front. Apparently, the woman's family didn't know the origin of the stone, saying they used the reverse side of it to make fudge. Stoker donated the stone to the Friends of Lansing's Historic Cemeteries, but a genealogist was able to find any surviving family members... Uh. A Weller who died in 1849. However, they did track down his grave, which had been moved in 1875. That's probably when the gravestone was lost, experts believe. Cemetery preservationists restored the stone to Weller Curtain resting place and repaired and cleaned those of his family members nearby. They found out their fudge maker was a stone. <laughs> was a gravestone that was lost in 1849. Thank you for subscribing and liking and sharing. Who's your daddy? Two men in Byron, Mississippi couldn't believe their luck on September 19th when they came across an Acura with keys in the ignition and a free car sign. People.com reported they drove the car to a family member's home and started checking out and that's when they found a surprise in the trunk, the body of a 34-year-old Anthony Acrylis. Get away from this. The body had been there at least 24 hours. Noted Copaya County Coroner Ellis Stewart. Men called 911 and waited for authorities. The car was registered to Macrillis and his death is a mystery. He had no visible signs of trauma. There said an autopsy is underway. Well, what a find. You know, I, it's hard for me to find a jack. These people find a full live body. Well, no, I find a full body. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing. Who's your daddy? This is where I start talking about the film My Uncle Was a Vampire, which was released in 1959. Christopher Lee had just made one of the best Dracula films of all time in 1958. You make a great film, Christopher Lee, so what do you do? Well, you fly to Italy to spoof that film. I do not know if the film was actually released in America in theaters, but the film was released on television in 1964 in America. Yes, the Hammer Girls were a popular fad in the 60s and 70s for monster fanboys. The Hammer films would have pinup type shoots with pretty actresses posing seductively to help promote the release of their films. To become known as an extremely good actress. I hope to get an Oscar sometime. Hammer actresses were mostly not British because the proper British woman was too prude to do such drivel. My Uncle Was a Vampire was a sex comedy that does not stand the test of time. Later films in Italy got scarier in Italy because of the Hammer film's popularity in Italy. Italy showed more skin when the censors around the world started to become more liberal. My Uncle Was a Vampire becomes just a bizarre piece of film because the purpose of showing scantily clad women just seemed tame compared to the sex comedy of the 80s. You saw more skin in horror films of the 80s than this film. You will find yourself just giving up by the 15 minute marker of this film. Lee appears 20 minutes after the film starts unless you want to count the casket of the count. You oh, don't do that. You have to love the Germans after World War II. Japan and Germany became to be known as the perverts around the world. Germany had their dirty films and Japanese had their dirty comic books. I think a lot of this is because of the military bases that were put there after World War II in those two countries. Thank you, Marshall Plan. The vampire happening has the same plot as most vampire films. It has a castle and gothic dreams, then at a monastery of monks, an all-girls school, a funny gay guy, one sexy vampire, 
and perverts who wrote the film. And you got yourself one bizarre vampire sex comedy for the likes of 42nd Street or any X-rated theater at that time. If you like X-rated classics, then this film is for you. But the bizarre situation the plot has set up to see how bare natural breast in the 70s can make one feel very sleazy. Who's your daddy? Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. One time people thought Ringo Starr was funny and this unfortunately made Ringo Starr think he was funny. Ringo Starr wanted to make movies because he could not play music very well. I will just go over the plot. If you think Ringo Starr is talented, put down your drugs for a moment and listen to me. Explain the plot of Son of Dracula for you. A vampire! Vampire? Vampire? What are you saying? I'm saying vampire. The film plot is something like this. When Count Dracula, King of the Neverworld, is killed by a mysterious assassin, Count Down, the son of Dracula, is next in line to be the king of the Neverworld. Count Down is summoned by Merlin, played by Star, and yes, I said Merlin, as in the magician. Star dressed up as Merlin from the Santa Claus movies of the 50s, made by K. Gordon Murray. Count Down wants no part of it because he has fallen in love with Amber. Played by Susan Lee. Count Down wants to be human and with the help of a Van Helsing. For reasons he practiced in London, is the name familiar to you? Van Helsing. I should have known. Tiv Down's fangs are removed and he can now live out the rest of his days with Amber. There's some music in The Son of Dracula as well. Son of Dracula is not funny or scary. The music is not bad. If it was done right, it could have been the next Rocky Horror Picture Show. This is not the last attempt at a vampire rock movie. Okay. Good evening. Did I, did I startle you? Okay, just forget you ever saw me. Okay, because the next thing you know, we're going to go out on a date, we're going to fall in love, and then some crazy pirate is going to peg you with a hand bone. This is an actual line from Rockula made by Canon Films. The film was made in 1988. You might use your imagination and say that the film might have been better received in the late 80s. I mean, the music is just as good as any music in a Paula Abdul music video at the time. The 90s, when the movie was released due to Canon filing for bankruptcy and having no money to distribute the film. Miss Cindy and I are going down in the cellar to take a little nap. Master, please be careful. What is it? You nearly stepped on my dinner. And this music does not really work for the time of the 90s. The plot is this. The whiny virgin vampire who lives with his mom, played by Tony Basil, and this relationship between mom and son has been going on for 400 years. Phoebe, played by Basil, is one sexy vampire MILF. I feel very comfortable in saying that because she was probably my age at the time. Most dancers have great bodies because they have to stay in shape to do those dances. Vampire mom does everything to keep Ralphie, the whiny vampire, home at the nest. Even if it is to trick Thomas Doby, that is right, the blinded me with science guy, you can say he blinded me with this awful acting in this film. Of course, Basil Basil's character tricks Dobie's character, Stanley, to dress as a pirate and wield a ham bone and convince everyone that he's a heterosexual. <laughs> if you like the music videos of the 80s, this film will get you yearning for the days when MTV played music videos and not teen pregnancy reality television. Oh, oh Ralphie, did you forgive me? You know, I mentioned Basil as a sexy MILF vampire. I brought the pirate and Hambone and the music, and that is all you really need to know about this film. Who's your daddy? Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. Okay, since you guys like the EV vehicles so much, we got two vehicles or one vehicle, however you want to look at it. It's the same body for the two vehicles, but with a different battery. So the one pack has a weight of 332 kilograms, as you can see right here, which is the Wuling EV50. And of course it has a range up to 186 miles. The pack two you can get with the weight of 308 kilograms with the range of 152 miles. Depends how fast you wanna go. You never know. You how much you want to go, you may want to haul 
And if you need 186 miles, I guess if you're like uh, got some prohibition stuff going on and you don't want the cops chasing you and you want to out speed the cops, which I doubt nowadays. But the willing says that the LFB beta packs will last for at least 2 million kilometers and the starting price for the willing EV is about, I want to say, 13,000 euros. And how the BV, YD V3 is the best version with a more powerful motor and more energy dense BYD blade battery and of course in a more realistic test cycle such as the uh wltp the range would be around 245 152 miles which is pretty acceptable for an electric cargo van that means that this thing is going uh can go up to over 100 miles and it's powered by electricity and if you guys need something to haul back and forth uh, and you get one that goes faster than the other one's heavier than the other and you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing. Who's your daddy? Okay, some students at Piedmont High School in Union County, North Carolina, were upset after reading White was placed on a drinking fountain at the school. The Charlotte Observer reported on September 23rd a Snapchat video of the sign circulated on social media. The parents became upset, prompting a response from Principal Dylan Stammy. That's racist. Who said he had investigated and the placement of the sign was not intentional. During practice, a cheer sign was just left outside the gym floor and it was picked up and placed on a water fountain. He apologized for anyone's offended, he said, by cheerleaders. Remember, go white. Go white. Go white. <laughs> you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and Sherry, if you have trouble getting your music distributed, check out DistroKid and Leaf Flow. You guys have work with your daddy. In Summit County, Colorado, schools are struggling to find bus drivers. But Josh Smith 12 has a solution. Smith, who lives with his parents in Silverthorne, approached them about kayaking to a school across Lake Dillon rather than having them drive him the long way. I have a 12-year-old who wants to be adventurous, wants to do something none of his buddies would do. And how I can say no to that, said Jason. Josh is dead. KDVR TV reported that on Josh's first commute, he arrived almost on time. I was late to one of my classes. Everyone was like, Josh, where were you? We were worried. And I was like, oh, I was kayaking to school, walking home on a shovel to school. Or, you know, your parents are saying you got to walk through 50 miles of snow. How about kayaking? There you go, folks. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing right here on the Coconut Daddy channel. Tommy Kirk said that he was walking down the street when he heard two girls talking about him. He said they said he looked like someone from the 50s. I knew the part when Old Yeller was going to die was coming up while I was watching Disney's Old Yeller when I was a kid. I told myself that I was not going to cry. I cried when Old Yeller died, just like any other boy, and I was not even a dog lover. I learned later while watching films that Hollywood loves making people cry. They get the right music and the right visuals. You will cry and sympathize and empathize about anything. How did we get Catalina Caper, Land of Giants, and Mars Need Women? Kurt was let go by Disney when his lifestyle became problematic. Some say because he was a homosexual. Make it go away, Tommy! <laughs> but that same year, he was caught with possession of drugs. This forced Kirk to make these subpar bikini flicks and Disney ripoffs. Kirk was lent out by Disney like Annette Funicello and was allowed a starring role in these first test surf exploitation films that combined operlisk routines with cinema and surfing. Many of the films featured the pop stars of the day like Stevie Wonder and of course, Little Richard. Kirk was bitter many years after losing his job at Disney. One of his greatest achievements in life, however, was leaving the addiction to drugs and moving away from Hollywood and making a life for himself. Kirk retired from the carpet cleaning business in 2006 and had done some brief cameos in movies and was featured as a guest in Disney conventions later in his life. Disney conventions, apparently they are a thing. Thank you, Tommy Kirk, so much for letting us enjoy Catalina Caper and Village of the Giants through the eyes of MST3K and saving us from Annette's belly button. Comment below about your memories of Tommy Kirk. Who's your daddy?
Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. A Spanish marketing professional decided to try to stand out to potential employers during his job search by creating an interactive resume bot that essentially allows him to answer questions he would expect during a live in-person interview. The unique innovation landed 29-year-old native David Vidal 30,000 interviews in one week. I don't think a conventional resume works anymore, Vidal said, and the most important thing for me was demonstrating my marketing and communication skills and proving that I'm a creative person who thinks outside the box. Wow. Uh, that's... That's interesting. So the resume bot begins when employers click the first prompt, let's start the interview. It follows up with several automated questions that recruiters can choose from to ask Vidal, such as what's your biggest professional achievement? What does success mean to you? And tell me three of your weaknesses. The bot then provides automated responses to recruiters for each. I wanted to stand out from other candidates and allow recruiters to get to know me better. You also wrote here under special abilities, you, you can do that. Of course, like said, he wanted to think out of the box, but he didn't want to think out of the box. Get it? Right, you guys can subscribe, like, and share right here on the Coconut Daddy channel. Who's your daddy? From advertising your podcast or just plain ideas to starting a podcast, click on the link below and get one month free with Podbean. Hey, you got my porn, my cannibal film. Well, you got your cannibal film into my porn. Nudity was all over the cannibal gore film. You could pay a group of Filipinos to run around half naked, chasing a naked, beautiful Italian actress at a decent cost in those days. And if you really wanted to save money, you could make your way to Thailand, which was closer to Italy. When animal activism started to spike in Europe, these films were too taboo in many European countries, which involved live animals being butchered. If you're going to eat the animal anyways, why not? get some great footage out of it I say I know that meat in my hamburger did not get on my bun by walking on it some places fry their burgers that's something we don't do we broil our burgers on a plane yeah. man from deep river is basically an Italian version of the American film called man called horse a film in the 70s before dances with wolves I guess that is fair to say you know one of those films where white people are supposed to learn about the other's culture why at the same time saying to themselves look how civilized those savages are the man from Deep River is not bad, is not horribly shot. I really think of it as a man versus man survival film where man has to do what he can to survive, even if it is to adapt to another culture. I know during this time, Americans were making Star Wars, but Italians were making porn for England and Germany who love that stuff, and maybe they got to our beloved 42nd Street every once in a while. Even before the bigger budgeted cannibal films, a little film that could call Emmanuel became the craze over Europe and then came the Black Emmanuel series. What makes a series of Black Emmanuel so great is that they were filmed in exotic places like Thailand or Turkey or, hey, the Amazon. Laura Gossmer is one of the most gorgeous people who ever walked on the face of the earth. Black Emmanuel series involved high production music recording, wonderful quality filming, and they explored every fetish known to man. See Emmanuel in America, if you do not believe me. In the series of Black Emmanuel, Emmanuel would explore bondage and other taboos, so why not the cannibal fetish? The year was 1977, and the film would grace the shelf along with the VHS cannibal films of the 80s and believe me it holds up right along with them i'm going to say it that cannibal holocaust is the greatest european cannibal chunk gore movie out there i'll start with the soundtrack which still gets stuck in my head in which a good music soundtrack is supposed to do although a child of the 80s is thinking why is this a soundtrack when i have time i will tell you it was the highest grossing horror found footage film of the 80s Take that, Blair Witch. It was an actually found footage film that was actually good, so take that again, Blair Witch. You sit on a throne of lies. The film still stirs the imagination of any filmmaker on conceiving why Diodato got away with making the controversial film. I definitely would recommend this film to the not so easily offended. Whether filmmakers trying to capitalize the success of Cannibal Holocaust, many just tank because the Cannibal Holocaust ripoffs were more of the freaks of cinema. You know, filmmakers want to see how far they could push the buttons of censors before getting banned, and they thought they could make the next Cannibal Holocaust. 
Cannibal Frog shows where the spike of the cannibal gore films were going. The movie Cannibal Frog lacks the emotional connection with the audience that Cannibal Holocaust had. They saw the violence of Cannibal Holocaust and really not the story of the film. Frog is probably one of the better attempts of the Cannibal Holocaust ripoffs. Just Franco's attempt. You have to love Franco's honesty. He said he did the cannibal films for the money. I did the cannibal films for the money. Massacre in Dinosaur Valley. One thing that kept the cannibal gore film genre around for a long time was the popularity of Indiana Jones. Massacre in Dinosaur Valley could be counted as an Indiana Jones cash grab. It has an adventurer like Indiana Jones running through the unknowns of the jungles fighting cannibals instead of Nazis. Either way, I had to throw it in because the star of Devilfish was in it. Video and X-rated theaters help make the makers of these films rich. But if you could get one great story out of it, is it really worth it? You tell me in the comments below. Were these films made to be good or were they made to take the money off the ones who would pay the money to see things they would not be able to see in real life? Subscribe, like, and share right here on the Coconut Dating Channel. Who's your daddy? If I were in New York right now, I'd probably be out shopping. Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. Why would a writer even glorify the notion of brother and sister making out? Pancakes. Pancakes. This is nothing new for writers to write of this forbidden taboo called incest from the Greek mythologies of old to the science fiction saga of Star Wars. Yeah! Writers will avoid talking or condoning violence, but have no shame writing about incest. Here is a list of movies that are just weird about the taboo of incest. Don't look at me. It is bad enough that Ginty had to go to the foreign market for a stable income in the movie business. The movie White Fire is an adventure crime movie about two thieves who are orphaned at a young age and raised by a career thief who teaches them about the business. Bo, played by Robert Ginty, and Ingrid are brother and sister, and we do not get any hint of romance between the two until we get to the pole scene where Ginty creepily says he wished she wasn't his sister talking to Ingrid course. The movie does not stop being weird here. Ingrid is replaced by a hooker because, spoiler alert, Ingrid dies. The hooker is paid by Ginty and his adopted father to have plastic surgery to look like Ginty's sister. The writer tries to justify this strange request because Ingrid, the sister of Ginty's character, worked on the inside for the company that they're going to steal the white fire diamond from. I can understand they explain the time away, but it's still not needed except so that Ginty could make out with her, which he does. Oh my! Here are some more movies featuring incest between brother and sister. Angels and Insects. William Addison is a naturalist married to the wealthy Eugenia. William is called from a hunt in which he finds that Eugenia is having sex with her spoiled brother's Edgar. Let's just say it has been going on for a long time. Ow! And Beautiful Kate is set in the outback of Australia and dives into the past of a young man, a writer by the name of Ned, who's about to get married to his beautiful fiance Tony. Tony finds out while Ned is visiting his father that Ned had sex with his dead sister well long before she died. The viewers, of course, watch the pass of Ned and Kate and it seems we get this sick male fantasy of a strong-willed sister who wants sex from her brother. And of course, white, liberal, pretentious people love this film and of course, cause, well, they're perverts. Stinky family, Nettie. Blood is a Canadian effort into the forbidden territory. Chris Terry is pretty much a recovering drug addict who visits visits his prostitute sister only to be asked to have a threesome with one of her clients. The House of Yes. Finally, we have to mention House of Yes, a wonderful Thanksgiving movie based on the play of the same name. The film introduces Parker Posey to the Aaron Spelling world. She has the funniest lines in the movie. The movie is wild to say the least about the film and again does not give white people a good standing in the human race, especially to the males who fell in love with Parker in this film and the many who had a Kennedy fetish after watching the film. You are officially a better person than us. Who knows why writers write films like this? Pancakes. Pancakes. But it seems that incest movies get awards and praise. People make fun of action films and their believability, but to write a situation where a brother is attracted to a sister is harder for me to believe. Who's your daddy? 
be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. You might know her as a fashion designer for Troll 2 the movie and of course as um, Black Emmanuel. Uh, really? I've already said she's probably one of the most beautiful women who grace the earth. So let's look at 10 things that you might not know about the model slash actress and wife, Laura Gimser. She was born in Indonesia. Her family moved to the Netherlands later due to the conflict of communists and Islam. Well, what a pair. That might have been interesting, but good for her family to move out. Laura attended Artibus Art School. Laura attended Artibus Art School to study fashion and was discovered as a model there. She went to school to study fashion and some photographer said, WTF, you need to be on magazines. She appeared on the cover of Playmen. Playmen is an Italian erotic men's magazine and she was on the cover five times. She starred in her first film, Amore Libero, meaning free love. It was an Italian production shot on the gorgeous French island and described as an erotic adventure film. It was considered tame compared to her later films. Despite its mediocrity, the movie did the trick and got Laura noticed. Perhaps unaware of what she was in for, she moved to Italy to pursue her newfound acting career. Her first Emmanuel film was from the French Emmanuel series Emmanuel 2, and when she played a frisky masseuse, she's quoted as saying, I wanted to be a model. I was still a little girl. I came to Italy specifically to shoot Amore Liberale because someone was impressed by my photographs and therefore made contact with my agency. Even the part I did later in Emmanuel 2 was born because the director, Francis, was a photographer with whom I already made several nude and fashion shoots. I remember the day when he asked me if I wanted to do a part in the film he was going to make Emmanuel 2 and I replied, why not? And now for our sponsor. Be sure to click on below for our 10 day course on how to make money on OnlyFans. We will teach you how to be hot and look good and how to take money from idiots who know that Pornhub is free. Now back to our regular program. She was a cast in Black Emmanuel because the director saw her a tourism poster. That's right, Lord Gimser was discovered by the director of Black Emmanuel because the director, Bito Albertini, had seen her on a poster at a travel agency in Kenya. Easy lions, only in Kenya. And fell in love with her good looks. She was married to her husband until the day he died. Gabrielle Tinti was an Italian B actor, and Laura and him married in 1976, and she stayed with him until the day he died. Although he was older than her, the marriage seemed to work out. She refused to do the hardcore stuff. Laura was asked by Albertini to do some racy hardcore stuff like a gangbang with jocks, but Laura refused. In the end, she is replaced by a stand. Any excuse is good to get naked. I saw the one, the first Emmanuel, because I was curious. And then I felt bad because I didn't expect to see. I uh, refused a lot of scenes. They put in a stand in and I didn't know. So when I saw the movie, I felt rather bad. There was a scene in a train. I think it was. She was making love with the whole football team. I don't remember. But I refused that scene and they refused stand ins. And I don't know what are the scenes. I forgot. Really, I forgot. She tried to go mainstream by changing her name in 1983. Laura would star in a made for TV movie, Love is Forever, directed by Michael Landon. And they wanted to change her name, the production and director, to Maura Chen. She is quoted as saying, This was at the behest of the director and the production. They didn't want my erotic past to connect with the film, which was a story for the whole family. So they gave me the name of Maura Chen. But it didn't help because everyone wrote Maura Chin is Laura Gimser. Paul Bartlett, the director, was an American who wanted to change my life. It was a little bit nasty. He was a moralizer. It forced me to deny even in the face of evidence. When in Thailand people said to me, are you Laura Gimser? I had to say, no, no, I'm Maura Chin. It was embarrassing. She starred in a workout video. After her days of Black Emmanuel, she would do a workout video directed by Dick Randall. It could be borderline softcore porn, but hey, we'll get you going in the morning if you want to get some exercise done. So tell me if you like this way of presenting the B-Cyclopedia by subscribing, liking, and comment below. You guys have to be your daddy.
Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. When Richard Mall was asked to do Night Court, he was, of course, asked if he would shave his head. He said, shave my head. I'd shave my legs for the part. And the rest is, of course, history. Richard Mall, best known as Bull Shannon, the bailiff on the NBC sitcom Night Court, is still an American actor. He was born in January 13th of 1943 and of course he was best known for playing the role of Aristotle Nostradamus Bull. <laughs> Maul has also done extensive work as a voice actor typically using his deep voice to portray villainous characters in animation and video games most notably the voice of Two-Face in Batman the Animated Series and Batman the Brave and the Bode. Charles Richard Maul was born in Pasadena, California, the son of Violet, a nurse, and Harry Finley Maul, a lawyer. He was tall early in his life, reaching six foot by age 12. He kept growing until about six foot eight. He attended the University of California, Berkeley, and was a member of the Kappa Alpha Order Fraternity. Ma was studying to be a psychologist there. And then in a 1977 film, Brigham, Ma credited as Charles Ma, appeared as Joseph Smith, founder of the Latter-day Saint movement. Ma would go on to often portray hulking or imposing characters due to his height and deep voice. In 1979, Ma played the part of Eugene, a gangster on the TV series Happy Days. And as you notice, most of the B-stars got their roles from Happy Days. We've uh, talked about uh, Red Brown, who was also on that show earlier. And of course, in 1981, Maul Cole starred with Jan and Michael Vincent and Kim Bassinger in the movie Hard Country. And you'll find that Jan Michael Vincent starred in many, many uh, B-movies after his career on Airwolf. And he also played the abominable snowman Richard Maul did in the comedy feature film Caveman. The same year, he had a small part in the sitcom Mark and Mindy and where he appeared with his future fellow Night Court TV series cast member John Larquette. In 1982, he played the Sorcerer in The Sword and the Sorcerer. And then, of course, we see where his B-movie acting starts there, because he goes from there to uh, the movie Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Zinn. The same year Night Court came out, he also was in the movie Dungeon Master. Maul also used the bull persona and commercials for Washington's Lottery, but he played the role of Big Ben in the 1986 horror film House. He earned a Saturn Award nomination for that role. Ma played also Otto and James Hansen in the movie Night Train into Terror. Ma made an appearance in the first episode of Highlander, the TV series, and of course, his guest appearance on Babylon 5. Now, in the movie Night Train into Terror, we have God and Satan talking about uh, how to <laughs> deal with people's lives. These are three movies put into one movie in that movie, Night Train of Terror. And, of course, Maul, of course, played these two roles in that film because it is a film full of several stories put together. In Super Password, he appeared with Judy Norton Taylor, Nancy Lane, Marky Post, Glory Loring, Florence Halep, Deborah Moffat, Elaine Joyce, and Kim Morgan Green with Burt Convey as a game show host from 1984 to 1987. Of course, Maul played himself in The Facts of Life, Season 9, Episode 1 and 2. Maul appeared in The Flintstones and Casper Meets Wendy. He was the uh, ghost in Scary Movie 2, uh, Nickelodeon Hunter Deeds for Eddie McDowell. Uh, you'll see him as the fire chief in a film that I really, really like. He was also the voice of Batman in the animated series, not Batman, but of course Two-Face. If you like these B-Cyclopedia shows, go ahead and subscribe, like, and share. And thank you for watching. And you guys have a great day. Who's your daddy? Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it. Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. Red Brown was waiting to get on the sheriff's department and working as a bouncer. 
at a bar in Pasadena called the Handle Bar Saloon. An agent who had a client at the nearby Ice House came in and saw Brown there while Reb was in the middle of throwing two people out. Reb had one in each hand and was banging them together to throw them out the door. The agent asked Brown, hey kid, do you want to be an actor? Brown said just a moment and continued what he was doing. Brown came back in and said, I don't know. I don't know what to do. The agent said, that'll work. Brown was on the sheriff's department for a period of time and then ended up doing a film called S with Dirk Bennett Dick and Heather Menzies. The movie needed a football player that was kind of a big guy and could play a jerk. Brown went in and read at Universal, did a test for him, and he got the job that day. He had a job, and that's how he got involved. Red Brown, born Robert Edward Brown, born April 29, 1948, is an American former football player and actor. Brown is perhaps best known for playing the lead in the television film Captain America and the action war film Uncommon Valor. He is also known for the 1983 cult classic You're the Hunter from the Future. Regarded as a classic B-movie, as well as a sci-fi film Space Mutiny, and for the collaborations with director Bruno Mattei in films such as Strike Commando and Robo War. Brown's father was a policeman who had also been a singer. He grew up in the Los Angeles area and played football at the Temple City High School. After graduating in 1966, he received a scholarship to play fullback at the University of Southern California during the 1967 season. He ended up losing the starting running back position to another student, O.J. Simpson, and Brown decided to transfer to another college in the Los Angeles area. Brown's acting career started in 1973, uh, which he appeared in The Girl Most Likely 2, and when he began acting, there was already a Robert Brown in the Screen Actors Guild, so he took his initial Rev as the first name for acting. He later appeared in guest starring roles in several Universal Studio produced television series, including Emergency, Marcus Welby, Kojak, The Eddie Capra Mysteries, and The Rockford Files. He also appeared as a rebel, a southern boy who had a fight with Ralph Mouth in Happy Days, and played Jim Bridger in the All Star miniseries Centennial. Also appeared in Three's Company as Elmo, a date for Chrissy's show. He also played Captain America in two made-for-TV films, Captain America and Captain America 2, Death Too Soon. During the 1970s, part of the same development deal that yielded the Lou Fregna vehicle, The Incredible Hulk. In the film Big Wednesday, Brown played the role of the Enforcer. He landed the supporting role of only starting white member as a freshman of the team in the college basketball comedy Fast Break, starring Gabe Kaplan. In Paul Schrader's 1979 film Hardcore, he played a bouncer in a neon-lit sex shop who throws George C. Scott into the street after Scott's character becomes rowdy. In 1983, Brown landed a role in the cult film classic Yore, the Hunter from the Future, as well as, as Blaster, a Vietnam veteran character who trains with other vets in a POW rescue operation in a common valor. Critical claim for Brown came in 1986 Australian film Death of Soldier, which is based on a true story starring James Coburn. Brown received a nomination for Best Lead Actor in a Dramatic Role by Australian Film Institute for portrayal of serial killer Forever Edward Leonsky. Brown later starred with Lou Fregno playing Vietnam War veteran buddies in a pair of action films Cage and Cage 2. Brown also appeared in Bruno Mattei's Strike Commando and Robo War. Brown has continued his career moving between television feature films. He is perhaps best known for portraying the main characters in 1988's Space Mutiny, which was lambasted in an episode of Mystery Science Theater of 3000. He appeared in the third season of Mommy Vice episode, Viking Bikers from Hell, in which he played a sociopathic biker avenging his buddy's recent death. After not appearing in screen in 18 years, Brown co-starred in 2012 in Night Claws. Now, of course, he's best remembered to me as Captain America when I was a kid. I remember the motorbike, I remember the helmet, and you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing. Who's your daddy? Be the envy of your friends. Wear the sexy cosplay t-shirt. Wear it on a podcast. Wear it to convention. It's comfortable. Heck, even sleep in it.
Your girlfriend will love it. You will love it. Click on the link below and get your sexy cosplay t-shirt shipped to you. All right, guys, so today we're going to talk about college movies, and there's a lot of them, and I thumbed through a lot of them. So I came to a conclusion, which movies would be the ones that I would pick as my favorite? I want to give, like, five favorites of mine, and I sat there and I thought, well, the way I would rank it is, if someone said they were going to watch these movies, would I watch them with them? And the answer is yes, I would watch these movies with people today. And we have to go over the ones I like. Let's start off with number five. This one became a recent favorite of mine. The movie is called Dead Man on Campus. Of course, it stars Zach from The Saved by the Bell. I love this movie because it kind of gives you the stress of a new college student who has a scholarship, who's trying to move on with his life or trying to be in the shoes of his father. And it kind of gives you those two perspectives of those type of college people. And what ends up happening is they need to have a roommate who will commit suicide so that they can pay off their college debt it's a really good movie it's one of the first mtv movies mtv who i don't care for the cable station but at this time was some producing some pretty funny films and this is one of them i really like dead man on campus if you want to talk about sports in college there's no other film that makes me laugh than water boy bobby fouché is one of the funniest characters you'll ever see on screen he is played by adam sandler and this is one of my favorite adam sandler films plus a strong role by kathy bates who just nails this mother role she is the spoof of all those mothers that don't want you to do anything in all those movies it's a great movie i love this a number three for me is drumline I love Drumline. With having a musical background and also being in the world of music, this movie tells you all. It explains why you need to study to learn music. It also teaches you about where music comes from. It also tells you a lot of things. There is one part, scene where I see Orlando, who plays his character, and he says, now the radio is turned off, talking about playing real music, because it's not about sampling music. It's about creating music, and that's where I come from and feeling from creating music is one of the best feelings you can have when you create a wonderful hook or chord and the drumline expresses that drumline is one of those films that I recommend watching for college it's just great there are some great characters in it as well then there is of course Orange County Orange County is one of my favorite films a lot of people wouldn't relate to it, but it is about creativity too. Orange County teaches you that you don't always have to go out of town to find yourself. Sometimes your creativity stems from the pain and suffering or what we perceive to be pain and suffering to create. Without those origins of pain or bullying, sometimes we just don't have creativity. And so Orange County awakens the creative person that sometimes it's not college. It's not all those things around you that will make you a better creative person, but it's that person inside of you. Are you creative? Are you taking the time to be creative? Every day you're not going to be creative, but one day a week you might be creative, or once a month you might be creative. Orange County is one of those films. It's I love it. I can watch it over and over again. And again, like I said about these films, if someone said, hey, we're going to watch Orange County, I'm going to sit down and watch it with them. And of course, finally, Animal House. And I did think about this, and this is the most important college film out there. Animal House is... 
the staple of college films. It's established the characters, and it established what's right about the college films. It's basically the underdogs and trying to overcome the overdogs or the overlords. And, of course, Animal House is that first movie that did that. If you see any college movie afterwards, you'll see characters that were designed from these characters from Animal House. And then you'll see the failures that were making money from Animal House. As a film person, you need to look at Animal House and ask yourself, what did they do right? And think about the right things, not the wrong things of the movie, and you'll get Animal House. And there you go, folks. Five picks that I have from my five favorite college movies. And if you guys would like to hear more reviews, click on the link below, subscribe, and share. Click on the bell. Who's your daddy? Want to start podcast? It's easy. Just click on the link below. Podbean has everything for you, all the tools you need from advertising your podcast to, or just plain ideas to starting a podcast. Click on the link below and get one month free with Podbean. Today, guys, we're going to talk about 10 life hacks to make a YouTube video every day, how to do it. So let's begin. Number one thing you will need to do is to get organized. If you go back to time when they used to make comedy shows or news shows, they would have a whiteboard with uh, show ideas. Once the show ideas or what's the upcoming event coming up, then the writers would write around it or they would write uh, the news around it. And like I said, shows that were produced ahead of time, and we'll get into that later. So I would recommend to get organized is to invest into a wipe board. You can get these at the dollar store, but I don't highly recommend those because they break really easy. Of course, you can place them on refrigerators, you can place them on the wall, you can place them on a desk like I do. And then once you're completed the go, you can uh, wipe it out. So one thing I do is, uh, with the whiteboard, is I try to figure out what day you should have what video. So I'll say, Monday we'll do this, Tuesday we do this, Wednesday we do this, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So what you have to figure out once you do that once you figure out what days to release what video figure out which one is the hardest and work on that first for instance if it includes more editing or more dubbing then you should go ahead and work out that one first upload ahead once you do that once you have created your video, you want to do it ahead of time. I recommend seven days in advance to almost two weeks in advance. If you're creating seven videos for the entire week, which you need to do, you can possibly do that in a two-day period, possibly four-day period. You need to release them ahead. So set your day. I recommend going for the first of the month. If you start in the middle of the month and you'll say this is July 15th, which it isn't, well, you would start August 1st is when you release your video, or I would say Monday, August 1st is when I release the video. So once you have decided your goal date, then once you upload that video, you'll go ahead and produce the thumbnail, the information about the video, and then you'll release the video, and it will go out August the 1st. So that's what I would do to try to do, start this because and you'd let, let people know, keep up to date with your Instagram, keep it up to date with your TikTok, keep up to date with your social media, Facebook, let people know you're making videos. That's the reason why you may not be releasing some in the next two weeks, you know, just for the sake of, you know, letting people know. You know, that's the whole thing. There's an excuse is something that you 
make afterwards if it's an explanation is something that you make before the video so explain to people I'm not going to be making videos for a couple of weeks or three weeks because I'm making more content for you that's especially for you because that's your number one people you need to target is those people that you make a video for um, number four set up a date to start okay five devote days you're going to devote your days for specific things one day for uploading maybe or one day for editing so for instance set up a day of just filming you can film maybe four or five videos in one day now I worked a full-time job eight hours and then after I did the job I would spend four hours on YouTube so what I would do is after I got done with work I would possibly go ahead and do dubbing first then I would provide the images probably the second day third day edit it fourth day upload in fact I would upload videos while I'm at work now it made it a little easier when we are in lockdown because I could run upstairs make sure videos were uploaded or up sure make sure videos are rendering or make sure videos are finalized when I was working at home because of the lockdown but let's say you weren't locked down you're working at your job you get off that job start working on a few things that one day say for instance that's the reason why the whiteboard is so important you can say Monday that's our dubbing day so that's a day you might record audio on Monday Tuesday that's the day we film so that's the day you film Wednesday that's the day I edit maybe Thursday as well because sometimes when you start out editing it may take a little bit longer this is the reason why I would give yourself two weeks before you start uploading on a daily basis that way you have time to edit more add music download music whatever you gotta do to get those videos because the easiest is gonna be probably finalizing it and uploading it because you're really not doing anything then while something is finalizing or uploading you need to film you take the camera down let's go film while something is uploading or something is finalizing because you need the gigabytes on your computer so you're probably not going to be online to get that up there so let's film okay so that's the reason why you need to organize your days and uh, of course I would recommend maybe devoting one day to socializing I used to one of my original channels I did was I would get up on I believe it was Thursday morning and I would go and see who subscribed and I see how they were doing uh, sometimes it would be on the weekends one young lady who used to upload videos and she had a large following she on the weekend would go by and check on all of our uh, subscribers and say hey how you doing I just seen how you like our content so you know they maybe do that on a Thursday or something like that I'll probably start doing that again I kind of up done with that because I've been on Instagram and other social medias or Facebook and not paying attention to that uh, number six is write your ideas down uh, something about writing something down sticks in your head psychologically better uh, and also take a break from the computer and write things down because uh, go when you go to lunch go to out lunch take a pen and paper with you get some ideas start writing things down while you're eating a lunch I used to go to Burger King and places like that and just sit there and just start writing ideas down spend an hour two hours in the place just a different environment to get away from you know the the office home office I guess you would say number seven uh, use your computers uh, or uh, phone calendar so you have a calendar on your phone you also have a calendar on your computer as the ideas come to head go ahead and type them into your calendar say you're going to be working on the computer you're maybe making a thumbnail okay an idea pops into your head write it down on the calendar to remind you the next day or the day that you have something set aside for Wednesdays instance I devote everything to my podcast on Wednesdays okay I have an idea for a podcast that pops in my head while I'm making a thumbnail I'll put in 
get in contact maybe with that podcaster if that's a situation to try to book them or try to uh, uh, take time to find out uh, some uh, podcast monetization, anything that you need to do for that, for regarding podcasts for that day, I'll go ahead and put it on the calendar so I have a day because like Wednesday I'll be like, well, what am I supposed to do? And all of a sudden the calendar pops up 9 o'clock a.m., get a hold of podcaster, 10 o'clock, get a hold of monetization, uh, situation for podcasting you know 11 o'clock go ahead and start booking other podcasters 12 o'clock record a podcast you know have it on your calendar and it will let you know as your notifications are doing things and of course uh, number eight which is a really great thing to do is make templates learn how to make templates for your thumbnails learn to make a template for your videos and what I'm trying to say is when I do a video like this, I already have a, an effect that I'm going to use that's pre-saved. I've already adjusted from a, another video that I'm going to use on this video. So have your templates ready. Have a template in your audio already ready when you're doing your mixing so you don't have to go and readjust your EQ again and readjust your gating or anything like that. Have templates. They're good to use everything. Audio, video, photograph, uh, everything. Because I'm going to tell you right now, when you first start out, it may take an entire day. That's the reason I say give yourself maybe two weeks before you start uh, recording uh, a, day, a video a day. So go ahead, and, but once you get the template set up, for instance, today I have five, four videos. I have four videos uploading and another video that is being finalized while I'm recording this. You see how this is helpful? <laughs> Why doing this? Number nine, while you're video editing, while you're podcasting, while you're doing anything, what you devoted that day for, turn off your notifications, off your phone, turn them off your computer, turn off your messenger, turn off your Facebook, turn off everything, devote your time to that video. People say, well, I've got kids and they might be in school. Okay, let me put, tell you something right now. You're not going to get this done unless you set aside some strict discipline. And my discipline is really simple. The things that you do, like scrolling through Facebook, you're not going to do when you're video editing. Turn that phone off and just set it for phone. Put the phone on silent. Put it in your pocket. When you hear a vibration, you know, if the kids, you know, might have gotten a fight at school, Put it on vibration. That way you know that, you know, the principal. Give your phone number out to only a few people because uh, a lot of times my issues is spamming. The more I do as business going, you're targeted from sellers. Uh, check your phone. If it says unknown uh, number, don't answer. If it says yeah, so-and-so school, you know it's just kids. If it's got your kid's number, you know, Brian... Whitney, Brittany, uh, Joe, Joseph, whatever. If you see those names, those are the time to pick up. But anything else, look at that phone. If you get a vibration, pull it out and see if it's important. If it's not important, put it to side. Turn those notifications off. If it's, if it's Jenny who just wants to send you a thing on a Facebook Messenger, turn it off. Turn off those notifications. Every notification you can until everything's done. And then when all that's done, then you can do that. Uh, you know, realize this is a job and this is important to you. If you don't got that in your mindset, don't even start doing this. This is work, folks. This is, I know it's work that I find fun, but it's my job. And I'm not going to answer a phone or answer a fan just because uh, to stop for video editing because I'm doing things for those fans, all right? Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. If you're in a relationship, maybe kind of share. Uh, you know, if you're in a relationship with wife, say, honey, four hours, I've got to go to YouTube. Well, during this time, will you answer the call? And the same thing with her. Have you take the turn on doing this. You know, you've got to be organized. That's what the wife 
Board is for. That's what I love about it. People today will stop at nothing just to read a notification and they don't get anything done. All right, number nine was the turn off notification. Number nine was turn off. But number 10, most of all, take a break away from technology. And let me tell you something. Like I said, I work eight hours a day. I do four hours of making videos, devoting to YouTube. Now that I'm doing this full time right now, I'm I've expanded on to a podcast. I've expanded on to making music again. We're going to be selling drum loops. All these things that I've devoted. But when I do the four hours a day, that's all you really need for YouTube. So you're talking, I'm saying 20 hours a week of your time. Five times four is 20. Have those videos uploaded on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, go hiking. Turn off the computer. Take the family to the beach. Take them to the park. No cell phones. No computer. Maybe one cell phone for emergencies. Take that stuff and throw it on the bed. Pack up and get out of town Saturday. Sunday morning, go to church or devote some time to something of importance and, and forget about these other things. Forget about that stuff. So those are my 10 life hacks to making a video every day. I know you can do this. We'll get into more things. Talk to you later. Who's your daddy? Want to start podcast? It's easy. Just click on the link below. Podbean has everything for you, all the tools you need from advertising your podcast to or just plain ideas to starting a podcast. Click on the link below and get one month free with Podbean.